depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how untraceable are his ways. The portion of his spirit-inspired word that fills our hearts today comes from John chapter 16, verses 5 through 11. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. These are the words of our Savior. In the name of Jesus, who has fulfilled his promise to send the helper to your fellow redeemed. Last week I had one of those dreams where I was glad when I woke up. I dreamt that we were holding a special service for the new carpet remodel in our church, and I was supposed to preach at that service. But in my dream, I forgot about the service, and I ended up showing up late, and everyone was wondering where I was. And not only that, I also lost my dress shoes. I was dressed in my nice suit, but I had a grubby pair of tennis shoes on. Certainly, I felt and I looked uh, like a complete failure. When I woke up, I still had those feelings inside myself, even though I knew that the dream wasn't true. I'm sure you probably had dreams like this before where you forget about something important or you're embarrassed in some way, and when you wake up, you have those feelings inside, but you're happy that it wasn't true. As Christians, we often worry and contemplate about our relationship with God, especially during rough times. Moments when we're weak in our faith or nervous about our faith can feel like we're stuck in a bad dream. This is obviously all the more true when we consider our daily actions and thoughts. We know that we ourselves are a far cry from what God expects us to be. We have multiple reminders on a daily basis of our sinful limitations and weaknesses. And it's ultimately these effects of sin that cause us to doubt our relationship with God. It's these effects of sin that can make life feel like a nightmare at times. <clears throat> As we contemplate Christ's promise of the Holy Spirit in our text today, a promise that was first realized on Pentecost, we see him explain the Holy Spirit's role in convicting us. The Holy Spirit is to convict people about what God's will and word is concerning their lives. And in our text we see three different examples of what the Holy Spirit will convict us of of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. On the surface, these do not seem to be three areas that we would want the Holy Spirit to convict us of because sin, righteousness, and judgment all reveal our failings before God. They all reveal our limitations and how we haven't been to the standard that God demands. Surely on our own, and in our own sins, the Holy Spirit's conviction work would seem like a bad dream because it reveals to us our sinful nature, reveals to us that we aren't equal with God, that there's something missing in our lives. So why would Jesus remind his closest disciples, just days before he was crucified, that he would send the Holy Spirit to do this? Why would Jesus send the Holy Spirit at all to do this if it wasn't a good thing for us? The answer is to view the Holy Spirit's work in relation to Christ's work. These convictions of the Spirit can be blessings for us because of Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension instead of being a curse. Christ promised to send the Holy Spirit after these events so that believers like you and me would have the full picture. With the resurrection and ascension of our Savior in view, the Spirit's work no longer seems like an intimidating thing. Because for those who trust in Jesus by faith, we see the great blessings that God gives us through the Spirit. As we take a closer look at each of these three convictions that the Holy Spirit proves to the world, we see that each one is listed in relation to Christ's victory. 
This is abundantly clear in the first one as Christ talks about sin. Even on its own, sin convicts us of our wrongdoing. Sin is a constant reminder to everyone, believer and unbeliever alike, that we are lesser than God. We don't really need the Holy Spirit to remind us of that. The Holy Spirit doesn't need to do something new in our lives to show us why sin is bad. But the Holy Spirit does it to reveal to us the importance of this matter, to reveal to us the consequences of dealing with our sin. We rely on God for blessings every day, earthly blessings like food and shelter and health. We need His guiding hand in everything we do. Sin is a reminder of how lost we would be on our own just in earthly affairs of this life. But the Holy Spirit comes to us in our spiritual lives. He gets to our soul and He says, you don't just need God for food and for health and for clothing. You need Him for the forgiveness of sins. All people are affected by sin and remain convicted of it, whether or not Christ is in their view. Even those who have little to no knowledge of Christ still know abundantly well that they aren't perfect, that they make mistakes on a daily basis. They simply look for a solution to those mistakes in a different area. But Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will reveal to us what sin means in view of His resurrection and ascension. Now that Christ has won the victory over sin and death, those who still hang on to that sin will not have that claim to victory. Those who willingly reject Christ and turn away from Him will not have the blessings that He gives and that He offers. This is the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings to us in the Word of God. It's meant to impress upon us the serious nature of our sin and where it's leading us to, but also the solution that we have through Christ our Savior. By convicting us of sin, the Holy Spirit also reveals that God has dealt with sin. If Christ had not died on the cross for our sins, then we would have no assurance before God that those sins are actually taken away. So every time the Holy Spirit comes to us and convicts us of those sins and tells us how serious they are, it is also a reminder that those sins have been dealt with. That we need no longer die because of them. That Christ offers us a way out. There is no promise without also having a punishment. We know that Jesus has suffered that punishment on our behalf. He suffered that punishment for the whole world. He only asks that we now believe. With Christ's death and resurrection in view, we see that sin is judged and that all that hold on to sin are convicted with it. The Holy Spirit's actively working among us today, implanting the word of salvation, teaching us about the seriousness of sin, teaching us about the solution of it, that we might be saved through it. The next point of conviction that Jesus lists is concerning righteousness. Jesus explains that the Holy Spirit will convince us of righteousness because Jesus is with His Father now. The very fact that we don't see Jesus among us anymore is proof that He is reigning with His Father, is proof that He is indeed righteous. Jesus has gone into heaven to demonstrate that righteousness to us. Righteousness is one of those words that we often use a lot, especially on Sundays in church, but we don't often think about what it means. What does righteousness mean to you? How do you get it in your life? What does it mean that Jesus offers it to you? By definition, righteousness means holiness or perfection. Now think about what Jesus is saying with that definition in mind. Because He ascended into heaven, because He is sitting at His Father's right hand now, interceding on your behalf, the Holy Spirit convinces you that Jesus is holy and perfect. Obviously, if Jesus was still here on earth today as one of us, people would probably question whether or not He really was the Son of God like He said. If He never went back into heaven to reign over us as God, people would probably only think of Him as a man. But Jesus says, the Holy Spirit now convinces you that because I'm gone, because I'm no longer here with you, I am indeed righteous and holy. I am indeed God and worthy to be worshipped. The knowledge that Jesus is God, however, and is ruling as God, is not, not always a pleasant thing. Our reception of this conviction of the Holy Spirit will depend on our relationship with Christ. 
if we trust Him by faith as our Lord and Savior, as the one who has paid for our sins, then obviously we want to know that Jesus is righteous and holy. But for those who reject Him, for those who don't want anything to do with Jesus, it's a scary thought to know that He really is holy and perfect. If we reject Jesus, we then will be required to produce our own righteousness before God. Christ's power as Almighty Ruler of Heaven and Earth does not change just because people refuse to believe it. But if we humbly believe in Him as our Lord and Savior by faith, His righteousness that He earned on earth, in our shoes, in our place, under the law, will be given to us. The Holy Spirit's job now is convincing you of that. Is making sure you know that when you believe in Jesus, His righteousness is transferred onto your record. His righteousness is what God will see when He looks at your soul. And that's a good thing. The fact that Jesus is in heaven right now, ruling with His Father, is also meant to impress upon us that we are living in the last days. Christ's final arrival here on earth to judge the righteous and the unrighteous, to judge sinners and to, 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 to judge the believers and the unbelievers can happen at any moment. Paul uses the picture of a thief and of a woman in labor to describe how unexpectedly the final day could arrive. Paul also talked about how the Lord would return as, quick, as quickly as you could blink your eye. Think about that for a moment. One, to, one moment you'll be seeing life as it is, as it is normally. The next moment, as quickly as you can blink, everything will be changed. Christ will be here on earth to judge believers and unbelievers. Righteousness will be the difference maker on that final day. Righteousness will be the difference between whether or not you possess eternal life with God or whether or not you are separated eternally from God. The quality of our righteousness will depend on where it comes from. If it comes from us, it's not going to be worthy. But if it comes from Christ, it will give us life. The last point that the Holy Spirit convicts us of is judgment. Judgment almost always carries a negative connotation in our world. Our society often uses the judgment as a bad thing. They often are overly sensitive to judging others, even if it's for their own good. But if you take judgment away, if we didn't have judgment in life, then nothing good would happen. We would have utter, utter chaos. Judgment keeps people in line. Judgment is there to enforce the laws that we have. Without judgment, people would be free to do whatever they wanted to without any consequence. But different judgments of this world and its governments always have their shortcomings because people will often put their own priorities and their own opinions in place of the impartial truth. But when God judges... It is always just and right. And the judgment that Christ speaks of is certainly comforting indeed. Christ says that the ruler of this world will be judged, that Satan himself will be judged. The final conviction of the Holy Spirit is that Satan will be sentenced to hell, that he will no longer be able to tempt us and to lead us into sin. This is definitely something that we want to happen. We want God to take away evil and the one responsible for evil. But it's not just Christians who want this. Even unbelievers want evil to be taken away. Even those who reject Christ want some end to the ills that they experience here on earth. They want to see their problems taken away. Everyone wants to see the guilty punished and the innocent vindicated. Well, the problem is, everyone has their own definition about who's innocent and who's guilty. People look forward to the judgment of those they think deserve it, but not the judgment of themselves. But the Spirit's message is not just one of victory over Satan or a judgment of Satan. It's also a message of judgment against our own sinful flesh and the wicked world around us. This means that we too must be ready to be judged by God, for we will. This is where believers and unbelievers will split off in their thinking. Unbelievers want others to be judged, want those who they say are evil, like murderers or rapists or thieves, they want those individuals to be judged. They want the harsh penalty to come down upon people who deserve it. 
but they're not willing to look at themselves. They're not willing to look at their own sins of pride or of lust or of evil thoughts and want those things to be judged. God's Word is impartial on the matter. God's Word says that a sin is a sin. Christians, on the other hand, look forward to God's judgment of sin. We look forward to it because we have that righteousness of Christ in our place. We look forward to it because the judgment of sin means the end of sin. That's what the Holy Spirit is here to convict us of concerning judgment. The promise given to us that one day this sin will be gone forever. That one day our bodies won't have to deal with it. Our minds won't have to be tempted by it. We won't have to fall into it like we do so often because it will be gone forever. The Holy Spirit brings these blessings and promises to us through what God has done for us. And they're meant to assure us, not to make us scared. But we must also remember what the Holy Spirit uses to accomplish all these things. He doesn't use anything from us. He doesn't use anything from the world. He uses His own Word. And the Spirit has claim to that Word because the Spirit is the one who authored the Word. The Spirit is the one who inspired it word for word that we may have the truth in our hands today. In the law, we are convicted of our sin, our unrighteousness because of it, the impending judgment that we look forward to on the final day because of our sin. That's not a pretty picture for us. But it's not the only message that the Holy Spirit has authored for us. The Spirit also promises us and convinces us of Christ's payment on our behalf of Christ's righteousness in place of our own, and of Christ's judgment of sin and wickedness. Without our Savior's aid and help, without His promise to send the Holy Spirit and His fulfillment by doing it, we would have just a desolate reality concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. It would indeed be a nightmare that we would never wake up from. But we can thank our God today and we can praise and honor and glorify Him because He has interceded on our behalf. He has sent His own Son as our substitute to take the horrors of sin in our place, to suffer them as He did, and to turn the situation into a pleasant reality of forgiveness. That's the beautiful picture of the Gospel that we celebrate every day and that we celebrate every Sunday when we come here for church. That's the pillar that our church is founded upon, just as it has been from that very first Pentecost Sunday. May we ever keep this gospel message and the word of our Savior brought to us by the Holy Spirit as our sure and certain foundation. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.